I am Margaret Owen. I'm the director of the Center for Children and Families, and I'm very pleased to welcome all of you, and in particular, Mr. Taylor Toynes, to give the third lecture of the Center for Children and Families Spring Lecture Series. Uh, we're excited this morning to get started, and I want to introduce first Dr. Megan Swanson, who is the organizer for the Spring Series this year. And Megan will give a few practicalities for the morning, as well as provide an introduction to Mr. Toynes. Megan? Thanks, Margaret. Um, so as Margaret said, my name's Megan Swanson. I'm an assistant professor of psychology and a faculty affiliate of the Center for Children and Families. Um, this is our third talk in the 14th annual Center for Children and Families Spring Lecture Series. We do have one final talk coming up at the end of the month, April 29th. It will be our keynote talk by Dr. Kim Noble, and the talk is titled Socioeconomic Inequity in Child Brain Development. Uh, before I introduce the speaker, I want to go over just a few pieces of business. We are obviously meeting virtually, um, so I ask that you all please hold your questions until the end of the talk, unless you have a quick clarification question. Rachel Berglund and I will be monitoring the chat from Teams and we'll pass along any clarification questions that come up during the talk. So Mr. Twains, don't worry about uh, keeping an eye on the chat. Our talk today is titled Bolstering the Superblock, How One Organization is Working to Build Community and End Oppression in South Dallas. Our speaker is uh, Mr. Taylor Toynes. He is the co-founder and CEO of Four Oak Cliff. He holds a Master's of Education from Southern Methodist University and a Bachelor's from University of North Texas, so he is a, a local for us here. Prior to his role at Four Oak Cliff, he worked at DSID as a fourth grade teacher and a student and family coordinator. His commitment to the community is apparent by his work as a victim's advocate for Dallas County's DA office and the Commit Partnership, which is a collective impact organization that cultivates a collaborative educational ecosystem in Dallas and does wonderful work. For his leadership, he has received awards from the United Nations, the NAACP, and Southern Methodist University. He was also named an Echoing Green Fellow in 2020. The Echoing Green Fellowship is an international program that invests in the brightest uh, social entrepreneurs. I have to admit, I went down like a total rabbit hole because I was so intrigued by this organization and the work that they do. Notable alumni for this program include Michelle Obama, who was a fellow in 1991, and Wendy Kopp, who during her fellowship year developed the Teach for America program. So wonderful people coming out of this work. And it speaks to the excellent work that Mr. Twains does. Um, today, he'll be telling you about the impactful and exciting work that's being done at Four Oak Cliff. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Toyn. So if you all could join me in uh, virtually welcoming him, that'd be wonderful. Thank you. Good morning, you all. Um, happy Good Friday. Forgive my tardiness this morning. Um, when we scheduled this, I don't think I realized that it was actually, you know, Good Friday. My daughter is out of school today so you know it's a it's a whole thing um you know trying to maneuver that world so thank you all for your patience and your grace as well and thank you for the uh the kind introduction it's it's um crazy to you know reflect sometimes on the things that you've accomplished and um hear them and i'm just grateful to have been a humble servant to my community um over these years and in my lifetime. Uh, but to go into a little bit um, about myself and, and the organization and the work, um, you know, for Oak Cliff, our mission is we aim to liberate Oak Cliff from systemic oppression through a culture of education while increasing stability and social capital. And we do so through four pillars of work, education, advocacy, community building, and the art. Um, our organization was out of a fourth grade classroom um, back when I was in my first year um, of Teach for America. I was teaching at W.W. Bushman Elementary School, which is located on Bonnie View um, in South Oak Cliff. I was one of those people who were blessed to be able to go into my neighborhood and teach for America. And um, you know, doing that work in TFA, it opened my eyes to so many things but the way that I even got to that point was very unique um 
one of the things that that I, I was recognizing early in life as a youth growing up in Oak Cliff is, you know, there's a lot of traumatizing things that took place. Um, and I wasn't, a, I wasn't conscious of those things as a young person, but as I was older and able to reflect, I was able to remember key instances and key moments in my life that um, shaped me to be who I was. And all of those things made me know early on that I wanted to have leadership in my community and I wanted to be able to uh, to serve people. So one of the first things that, um, one of the first people that I really had a, you know, a, a fondness or liking to was Thurgood Marshall. Um, Thurgood Marshall was an attorney. Um, as you all know, the first black Supreme Court justice um that existed but the recreation center that i grew up in was third good marshall recreation center and that recreation center for me was a very very special place um that held a very special place in my heart and i made a lot of friends at third good marshall um one of which name was eric hurt and while we were at uh third good you know summer camp he was someone that took me under his wing going into middle school um, I remember my sixth grade year going into seventh grade, he was a year older than me. Um, very charismatic, cool, fly, swaggy, all those things, cool dude. Um, and we grew up, but by the time we got, I was 15, he was 16, Eric was facing a life sentence in prison. Um, Eric was, was, uh, was convicted for a murder at 16 years old and, um, it changed my life. I watched that entire situation play out. Um, and I I never thought that I'd see anything like that that soon in my life. To see someone that was um, fighting for his life, literally fighting for his life. Um, and in that moment, I saw Eric. He got sentenced to 35 years in prison um, at 16 years old when he turned 17 during the trial. And in that moment, I realized that I never wanted to see something like that happen to a peer of mine or anyone after me. Um, so I dedicated myself and wanted to become an attorney like Thurgood Marshall um, to be able to be a leader in our community and be able to change things. Um, and I was on the track. I went to Skyline High School where I was in a cluster that was called Man in His Environment. The specialty of that cluster was sociology, psychology and law. So, you know, I, I did youth and government in high school, was privileged to go to Austin and get a bill passed. I learned the entire process. I went to college at the University of North Texas undergrad and I um, majored in political science with a minor in criminal justice, aspirations of becoming an attorney. And right out of college, I went straight to the district attorney's office where at the time the current DA was uh, Craig Watkins who was also from my neighborhood. Um, he's from Oak Cliff. Um, so I was, you know, glad to be there. Had a model of people around that were, you know, district attorneys. Took my LSAT, um, did all of that. Applied for law school, did everything um, and was preparing to go. And then I read an article that was titled The Cradle to Prison Pipeline. And in that moment, my entire world changed. Um, I saw the zip code that I was raised in was the top of the list with the most people incarcerated um, in Dallas at the time. I saw 682 inmates and only 2% college ready graduates on that list. And in that moment, I had so many thoughts and so many revelations. And I was actually at the DA's office and I thought, you know, I'll go to law school and I might come out of law school, be a DA for a little while, go into private practice defense. But I never really wanted to be a DA. And I really never, I, I wanted to know the law, but I don't think I really ever wanted to practice the law. I wanted to save people's lives. That's what, what I felt my mission in life and my assignment was, was to save and serve. So I happened, and this is just, you know, I, I, I have a strong faith and I, and I really believe that these were God's steps for me. Um, at the same time, I, I put together a program that was called the Enlightenment. Um, and it was to enlighten everyone on this data that I had found. 
I looked and saw who published this article and it was an organization um, that I went to and, and, and learned about them. It was called Dallas Kids First. And I uh, went there and at the time they had an executive director by the name of Miguel Solis. And I met Miguel, talked to him, I asked him how he even got to that position. And he told me, I did Teach for America. I was a teacher and you know I learned all these things. And when I did this event, Miguel had begun running for school board trustee. Um, and I asked Miguel, man, tell me more about TFA. He told me. So I made the decision. I said, I'm going to teach. I'm going to do Teach for America. That's the way I'm going to go about it. Didn't know how prestigious and all these things the TFA was. I just knew that was my end to the classroom. Um, didn't even know that I could have ended up in Albuquerque or New York or anywhere. I didn't know that. Um, but I was blessed to be able to be put right back in my neighborhood of Oak Cliff. And I was put into a fourth grade classroom at W.W. Bushman. And that is in that same zip code, the 75216 zip code. And didn't know how much nine-year-olds would change my life. I remember we did an activity um, in the classroom and it was based on, you know, Texas studies was one of the classes that we had. So it was about our environment and changing, you know, or things in our environment that we would do and change. So I put an anchor chart on the wall and asked my students, what are things that you would like to see change in your community? And the responses that I got from those nine year olds broke my heart. They wrote, I don't want to see murders anymore. I don't want to see drug addicts when I'm walking to school. I don't want to see prostitutes. They said all of these different things that just shook me to my core. And one of the reasons why is because it was um, something that I remembered myself. And at the time, you know, I'm in my mid twenties and I said to myself, these are the same issues that have plagued the community forever and they're still here. Um, what are we going to do about it? And I just began to try to encourage those young people. I knew like I had to do one person at a time, one person at a time. And an event happened where they found a dead body across the street from the school that I taught it. And just these things continue to happen, continue to happen. And I was just searching, trying to figure out what is it. But the one thing, um, you know, they say some of the best ideas come from a problem. And a problem that I had was I was tired of buying pencils and paper for my students every week. <laughs> every week I was having to buy all these pencils and paper. And um, I said to myself, you know, outside of all the big problems, right? Like those are some big systemic things that, that were happening. But this is something I could change. I could get pencils, I could get paper, I could get spirals. I could get those things. So um, I said, you know what? But my class the next year, I'm going to be prepared. I'm going to host a, an event, a block party type event. I'm going to get all my friends to buy paper, pencils and things and bring them to us for uh, my class. And we began to organize with my students. And um, we did we came up with the Four Oak Cliff Back to School Festival, um, which was the first event. And we had that event at a park I grew up in, Glendale Park. And um, it was a it was a lot of things that transpired for us to get to that that date of August 15th, which was the day of the festival. But to spare you the details, the day of that festival, um, the United Way got wind of what we were doing. They came in as a sponsor and um, it was a magical day. We had over 2000 people show up to the festival that day. Um, it was the first of its kind to take place in Glendale Park with that many people in the production that it was. We were able to get a thousand backpacks for the neighborhood, not just for my fourth grade classroom, but the entire neighborhood was able to come out, get backpacks full of school supplies. And we had the um, we had four things at the festival that we wanted to make sure we did. There was a voter registration drive, job fair, college fair and school supply giveaway. So not only did we give away backpacks, but we also registered about 150 people to vote. We had about seven employers out there and we had four colleges that came out as well that were able to provide information. But the most important thing I think that happened was 
joy was brought to the community on that day. Um, we were able to see Oak Cliff come together as one, and it was just special um, to see everyone that was there, see everyone's just, you know, interactions and, and, and you know, happiness that took place. Um, but I still knew that those strong systemic things were taking place that my students were telling me about um, from the, you know, incarceration rate that I recognized to the traumatizing murders and gun violence, those things. And I knew that a back to school festival would not be the one thing that it's a one day event. And I knew that it had to be a pro thing put in place. So we started uh, Four Oak Cliff as an organization. Um, I was blessed to be able, after my years within Teach for America, I went to the Commit Partnership where I was able to explore what nonprofit work really looked like and, and able to see it at scale. And at the same time, I was actually in grad school at, um, at SMU getting my master's in education. And I remember talking to one of my professors and she said, uh, what is it that you want to do? What, how, how, what, what work do you want to do? And I told her, I said, I want to change my community. I want to, I just gave her all these dreams that I had. And she said, uh, well, you need to look into a guy named Jeffrey Canada in the Harlem Children's Zone. Never heard of this man before. And I said, okay. I looked into him, saw the model. It was amazing. He has a great TED Talk. If you all want to see it, go check out his TED Talk. It's amazing. Um, and I was able to see the Harlem Children's Zone and build it as a proof of concept for my organization. It was everything that we needed to do. It had the dual gen approach that I learned about working with both child and parent. It was located in central Harlem and something that he did that was very significant was he didn't say, I'm trying to save all of New York City. He didn't even say, I'm trying to save all of Harlem. He said, I'm going to focus on these specific 97 blocks within Harlem in central Harlem and make an impact on that. And for me, I took that and copied it completely. I said, I'm going to go and get a specific area of South Oak Cliff that we are going to serve and target all of our energy, resources, and love to that space. And we called it the super block. That's the area in which we serve, which is mostly made up of the 75216 zip code. Um, and it was life changing. You know, we were able to get a storefront in Glendale Shopping Center. Um, ironic story, the day that um, I went to talk to the owner of the shopping center about leasing space, he had a 250 square foot office space that he said I could lease. And the only reason that he really gave me the time of day is because my grandfather had a convenience store in that sh same shopping center as a kid. And that weekend, um, we started a community garden and we had a pretty big person come help us start that garden. His name is Mark Zuckerberg. And he came out and helped us start our community garden in a freedman's town, uh, started by free slaves called 10th Street Historic District. And I remember going back to the shopping center um, that Monday, or it was on a Tuesday, and Mr. Heron saying to me, well, I knew you had this organization, but you didn't tell me you was going to have one of the richest people in the world helping you. And I was like, yeah, man, I, it was it was just a, you know, cool opportunity. And Mark Zuckerberg posted us on his page. And this is after the first back to school festival, but him doing that, you know, you never know what what people's relationships will do for you. And I understood that when he did that, it gave us a different legitimacy and it changed our um, social currency. More people were talking about us. We were in a different, I mean, you get Mark Zuckerberg to post you on his Facebook page, that's, that's different. And that, uh, one thing I will add to that is, I was not prepared for all that came with that. Um, it was a lot. Everyone thought I was a gardener. Everyone thought I was in the farm and then I was not. This was literally a community, a Martin Luther King Day community service event that we were doing. And we just wanted to start a community garden. I had no intention in going into the gardening space at all. But, you know, it happened that way. <laughs> um, but uh, Mark Zuckerberg did that. And a lot of people began reaching out to me on that front. And just to give you a tidbit on that garden, it's still there today. Um, it's serving the 10th Street area. We've grown it tremendously. 
from when he came and it was literally an empty lot when he came. Now we have a fence around it, pavilions and it's wonderful over there. But, um, you know, that was part of our story. Fast forward even more, um, using the Harlem Children's Zone and some strategic planning, we came up with our mission, the pillars in which we serve, and we had a home base. That space has now grown from that 250 square foot office space to it went to a 4,000 square foot fully renovated space in Glendale Shopping Center. In 2018, the Real Estate Council came out and built that out for us. Fast forward to today, now we have acquired what was the Moreland YMCA, and we went from a 4,000 square foot office space to a 20,000 square foot facility that sits on 10 acres that has a swimming pool, basketball court, the whole nine. Um, it's no longer myself. We have a staff of about 13 individuals um, that are out serving our community daily. Um, this week has been an amazing week for us. Um, we uh, relaunched our GED program since we moved into our new facility. Um, we started a phlebotomy course as well this week, and we're preparing for our summer camp and after school programs. And the original space that we had now is being occupied. We still own the building or have the lease for it, but it's being subleased by an org called the Lone Star Justice Alliance, which is doing work in that criminal justice reform space um, to be able to create bills and serve people within the community in whatever ways that they're needing an attorney. Um, so it's been it's been a true blessing and it's been a, a somewhat of a roller coaster. Um, but one thing that that uh, still stands true is that that prison population is still high. Um, recently, there was data that came out that said that the 75216 zip code not only leaves the city of Dallas, but it leaves the state of Texas with the most people incarcerated right now. Um, my friend Eric, that the trauma that I saw from his fight He's still incarcerated right now. Um, he's 34 years old um, and hasn't seen the free world since he was a teenager. Um, and that's something that I think about with all the young people that I've been able to serve from Bushman to Zumwa Middle School. And yes, 4 Oak Cliff has been able to do some amazing things. Yes, 4 Oak Cliff has been able to serve so many people, but I've still had to go to a funeral for a 15-year-old. I've still had to go to, you know, hearings for young people who are incarcerated or facing incarceration um, as character witnesses. Our median household income is still at $21,000 annually. We still are in a food desert. So there's a lot of work to be done. But one thing that I am encouraged by is that we still have time on earth and we still got breath in our bodies. Um, and with that, it, it gives me the zeal every day to get up and go out and be a servant um, to the people that we see. And I also know that, again, like I said, my faith is, is strong in, in um, the work and the purpose and the assignment that has been given to me. Um, I know that a lot of these things aren't coincidence. Just last week, I was in Harlem, New York City, and I bet you could guess who I was out there with. I was with Jeffrey Canada, which is crazy to me. It was one of the best things for me. I was able to be in Harlem with Jeffrey Canada and see the potential of what could be for what we have in Dallas. And out there in Harlem, he's built a school that sits in the middle of the St. Nicholas housing projects. There's a full school, kinder to high school. He has two schools out there, has an early learning center, has a community center, and it's just amazing. And not only did I was I able to get to see the work, but I was also able to build a relationship with Jeffrey Canada. So it affirms to me, I'm not in the work alone. Um, I'm thankful to be able to have someone like a Jeffrey Canada um, who's now 70 years old and has been doing this work for 30 years to provide and pour into me things that I can see coming. And this is an another tidbit. One really, really uh, a person that was very inspiring to me um, is a man by the name of Nipsey Hussle. 
Um, if you all aren't familiar with him, he was a, uh, he's a rapper from South Central L.A. Um, Nipsey Hussle did a lot for his community in South Central. I was blessed to have Nipsey come by and see our space and, and really learn about what we're doing with 4 Oak Cliff. And um, when Nipsey came, he was blown away with the work and was wanting to do so much. And I told him, like, man, this, like, the education work that we're doing in South Oak Cliff, I want to help do that in South Central. Um, and I told them there was some organizations I was familiar with that was, you know, trying to build things out in South Central. When I spoke with Jeffrey Canada, he told me that he came out of retirement the week after Nipsey Hussle died. He was in South Central L.A. Um, talking to people. No, he didn't just die. Nipsey Hussle was murdered. He was out there and he was learning about it. And he said, when I saw the distress in those people's face in South Central, it made me come out of retirement. I was supposed to be going to present this data to Nipsey Hussle days before he was murdered. Um, and I found out about him being murdered from leaving the prison after visiting my friend Eric Hurt. So all of that stuff just to me was like, man, I know that this path is for a real reason. And it's also things that are like extreme things that are confirming, like, what are the chances that this guy, the same person being murdered, inspired the person who inspired me to do this whole work to come out of retirement, to go back in and say, I want to build place-based entities across the country. I want to lend my expertise across the country. And then for me to be sitting in space with him, um, it's just been a fantastic journey. But in our, what I You know, my I, I was a classroom educator, you know, operating with the Socratic method. I like having conversations, um, but I want you all to know who I am um, and know the work that's taking place. And all, I think one thing that we have to do is is keep our focus and understand that our children need us, um, you know, and that the trauma that is taking place is real. But also understanding, too, that amongst all these things that are taking place in South Oak Cliff, um, that it is a resilient community, um, that it is a prideful community, that it's a beautiful space. You know, this year, South Oak Cliff won the state championship in football. That was a big deal. No DISD school has ever won state in football, but South Oak Cliff, the resilience of these young men and the staff and the school and everyone who helped them get there, South Oak Cliff, the students walked out of the school because of the dilapidated building. That walkout was led by the starting quarterback at the time, David Johnson. And now, you know, these boys who were seniors on this team, they didn't even have a field to practice on. They didn't even have a school. They were practicing in a parking lot. And to see the resilience of them standing as, you know, the champions um, is big for our neighborhood. Those things are the wins that we need to see for 4 Oak Cliff to move into this historic space, which was formerly the Moreland YMCA, which was the first YMCA for African-Americans all of the Southwest. And for us to be in that space and us being an organization of the community, and now the community don't call that more than YMCA. They call it 4 Oak Cliff. I can see my childhood home from the creek behind there. Like literally my bedroom window, I grew up looking at this building my whole life. And now to be in a space of ownership with people from my community to have done this with um, is really powerful. And um, I truly believe in collectivism. I believe in collective power. And I do believe that in order for us to see true systemic impactful change is going to take real um, collective efforts. It's going to take us to really be um, strategic and it's going to take a, a strong sense of understanding um, and listening from one another to be able to improve um, and see the change that we hope for um, so that our youth can have a better foundation to stand and live by.
Thank you so much for, for sharing your story and the story of Four Oak Cliff. It was um, inspirational is an understatement. Um, so we'll have some questions popping up in, in the chat, but as the organizer, I always like to, to take the opportunity to ask a first question. And um, I also want to thank Rachel for posting the Four Oak Cliff website in the chat and also the Jeffrey Canada TED Talk um, and the Lone Star Justice Alliance. So she's getting a bunch of links in there. So, but my question for you, uh, Mr. Toynes, is, you know, how as people who, you know, either live in Oak Cliff or close to it, or maybe not, right? But in Texas and are, are moved by your story, what can people do to help? Like what is for Oak Cliff need? Um, and we have a mix of people here that are from the academic spheres, but these talks are also designed for the public. So we have a pretty mixed bag group, but I'm just, you know, I wanna, I, I'm interested to hear from you on what we can do to, to support your mission. Oh, I think that's a good question. Uh, first and foremost, one of the easiest things is, you know, showing up and volunteering. Um, we have the biggest event, if you all would want to attend, is our Foil Clip Back to School Festival. Um, that's going to take place um, August 13th this year at Glendale Park. We back the past two years, it was a drive through festival because of the pandemic. But um, this summer, we're going to be back in person. It's going to be uh, it's a great event to come out to and volunteer it. Um, we have a farmer's market at the first the first Saturday of every month. Um, I see that uh, the website is in here. We keep a lot of different things posted in there. Um, follow the social media pages on Facebook as well as Instagram and Twitter. It's all for Oak Cliff. Um, but I would say, you know, one of the other ways is that, that you can support for Oak Cliff is really be like i said giving a deep understanding of what oak cliff is um and understanding how big oak cliff is you know i i, I heard our former mayor say that southern dallas you can fit all of atlanta um proper into southern dallas alone and oak cliff is the largest part of southern dallas and we're in south oak cliff so you know fig, just check out the website i'd always say if you if you have the means you know, you can donate funds um, to the organization in your time. Um, but I take prayers as well. All of those things uh, keep best wishes for us. Uh, get involved with the schools. You know, even if you don't get involved with Fort Oak Cliff as an entity, you know, there are a plethora of schools that you can get engaged with um, from the elementary to middle and high school ranges. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll follow up with you afterwards. Um, as a first generation college student, I always say that I'm happy to meet with anybody who's considering college and mm -hmm. there's this huge hidden curriculum there and it can be um, intimidating and and people can kind of not know how to pursue that avenue. So I'll, I'll follow up with you individually. But like I said, I'm always happy to to support students who are thinking of going that route. Um, so I will turn it over to other people's questions. And uh, Margaret, you have a question here. Do you want to unmute? Was. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Um, I've been very eager to learn more and more about Four Oak Cliff and uh, at least to have this uh, distal uh, means of meeting with you. Um, I think I told you that I've lived in Oak Cliff for, oh golly, since 1985. And I mm. always appreciated getting a different view of Dallas by living there, moving from Northeast Dallas to North Oak Cliff. But mm. Oak Cliff is enormous. Mm -hmm. and um, people think it's further to Oak Cliff than it is to North Dallas. It's not. <laughs> Just cross those beautiful bridges. Indeed. However, um, the things that you are bringing about are so tremendous. I think a lot of our audience, and myself included, are interested in uh, some of the efforts that we've heard about focused on very young children in that neighborhood. And you know, one general question was, what are you looking for to measure results of the efforts that you are initiating or taking that are taking place with young children and their parents? And also, could you tell us a little bit about the Lena project? In mm -hmm. 
of Four Oak, Four Oak Cliff. That'd be great. Sure. Thanks. For sure. Um, so a few things that that are um are happening within you know just our measurements and things that we're doing is um one we believe in this dual gen approach to education so we're looking at the measurements of progressing families as a whole um and, and in that for us is this has been a different year um before we did not have the space to actually provide as many child-centered programs in our space because we we were just so limited with the space so what we were doing was trying to help improve third grade reading scores um with partnerships so a few things we did was we hosted or if you all are familiar with freedom schools um cd is a program um the children's defense fund um fannie lou hamer and many other and the Freedom Summers, the Mississippi Freedom Summers um, started the Freedom Schools to increase not literacy, but the urge to read, like the love of literacy. Um, and that's something that we've hosted over the past, I guess we're going into our fifth summer now doing those. Um, so we've been looking at that. Another thing that we've looked at is the Lena program, like you said, that early learning space is really important. There's a tremendous word gap that exists um, within families, and we want to be able to have, you know, a program where we can see that. So we had a goal of reaching a million words heard for children um, zero to three years old. But not only that, too, we were able to also see bonding in the family come together um, during that time as well. So Lena is um, for you all who aren't familiar is a child would, or a toddler really, would have this vest that they wear for eight or 12 hours in a day. And that vest records the sounds heard. Yep, exactly, it's like that big. Records the sounds heard from the parent, and it also can project out the sounds that it hears from proximity to voice from the child. Um, and that helps to encourage, We when we have the classes, we encourage the parent, you can get your words by reading to your child. You can get your words by just talking to your child about what you're watching on television, even though they may not be responding to, you know, in a real conversation. But it's important for them to hear those words, because a lot of times people think babies don't understand. But that's the biggest brain growth that exists is in those formative years. Um, so we want to be able to encourage that as much as we possibly can. But one of the other things that just now we're we're in the process of, of beginning some strategic planning um, to come up with uh, with those those you know metrics we want to have very very radical metrics um, that we would use because of course like I mentioned third grade literacy but what are those impactful things that haven't been recognized that makes a difference in a child's life. You know, we're looking at that. We're trying to explore those while providing programming. Um, and we're still working with partners like Commit and CPAL as well to, to come up with those things. But what are what are the radical out of the box things that we can that, that haven't been utilized as metrics? Um, like one thing that we're actually with, within Lena and just in the nurturing of that early child space is thinking about well, how many parents or how many mothers have been able to breastfeed their child? And the reason behind that is because there is so much brain growth and development from breastfeeding that takes place that um, could really change a lot. You know, Jeffrey Canada told me something. He said, you know, he told me this parable, essentially, like a lot of times we're jumping in a river to save kids or save people. And he was like, and we feel good when we save them, but we got to ask ourselves, how are they getting there? And we have to look upstream. So what are we doing to get upstream to figure out why these people are coming down this river drowning? And um, one thing that, as he was telling me that, I thought about it, my wife is a, uh, she's a nurse. She's a labor and delivery nurse. And she told me a data point. She said that less than 14% of African American mothers continue to breastfeed after three weeks of breastfeeding, less than 14%. And 
that to me was like why I asked the question why, like what's going on, and then I thought of all the because also seven five two one six is one of the most unhealthy zip codes in the city of Dallas from asthma, diabetes, can all of these things, and I thought like man that's a space that. I don't think and that's a leak in the system that I don't know if a lot of energy has been put into. And I think that there are some simple things that could be changed. There are some policies that could be put in place as well to ensure that others are having the opportunity to do that. And um, another space that I think that I know we've seen a lot of growth for the families is the space of the GED. A lot of times we get caught up on college completion and high school completion and graduation rates. But as I was observing the data and I saw, you know, our only high school in the super block is, is South Oak Cliff. And I looked at, you know, about 15 years of graduation rates of South Oak Cliff and they all, it looked good because it was between, you know, 95, 98, 97% graduation. But then I said, okay, but that 2% is compounding what is happening to that two percent each year each year this is an ongoing thing and then i looked up 40 percent of individuals within the super block do not have a ged and that's over the age of 25 so that's not even 18 to 25 included in that 40 percent there are no concerted efforts towards a true programmatic ged effort and i you know they have this pipeline this educational pipeline to success, that is a major leak in that pipeline is the individuals who don't have a GED. And just by having a GED, one of the individuals that graduated from our program let us know that he was able to get a job immediately after getting his GED. Well, he had a job, but he increased his salary by $7,000 just by having his GED. Um, but also the culture of education that comes into that household Whenever a child sees uh, my mom and dad is coming home and they're studying. So what does that mean I'm going to be doing, you know, or now my my parent is actually going to do something with their lives. So now the kids, we have it to where the children are able to come to Fort Oak Cliff as well. While their parent is in GED, the kid is able to be getting enriched as well and whatever it may be. Um, so we've seen that as a, as a huge uh, metric uh, or of success. And one thing that I want to see scaled, we won't be able to decrease that 40% as much as I'd like to only at Fort Oak Cliff. So my vision is what will it take for us to get a GED class in every elementary school within the super block? Because now one of the things we know is that our schools say that they don't have much parental engagement. You know, they have lack of parents coming in. And I know from being a teacher, well, these parents need something worthwhile. Yeah, coffee and donuts with the principal is a cool concept. But what is that going to do for me? If you had a GED class at the school and a parent know they need that GED to progress their lives, now you got something truly valuable in that building. And you also are creating that culture of learning in the household for your school as well. And it would do so much, I believe, from, you know, just school culture, student discipline, all of that. So I think that's, to me, something that I would like thinking upstream um, to be able to change lives. And, you know, the GED could be the first time we have a full graduation for it. But that may be the first time that a kid sees a graduation in their lives. And now that's something that they're aspiring to do. Um, and that changes the trajectory of that household. Wonderful. Thank wow. you. Thank you. Uh, I know when 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 parents are get receiving education at the same time that their very young children are, this is creating a big jump in the commitment of those younger children as well. Oh. It's a two way street in that regard, and the two gen approach is the way we've got to go. Thank you so much. No problem. So Renee has a question here in the chat. Um, Renee, I'm not sure if you want to unmute and ask, and I'm also not sure if Mr. Toynes addressed your question further, or I can ask it. 
I can unmute. Um, so basically, I grew up in Oak Cliff as well, and um, really inspired because I want to do something similar. So I asked about like if Coral Cliff has any intents on going directly into the education system. So I was wondering if y'all have um, any plans to maybe work with teachers in schools in Oak Cliff, and how do y'all plan on like? doing these activities um, because you mentioned like the back to school fest, but I was wondering more directly in the public education system. Yes, good question. And indeed, um, you know, I was a struggling first year teacher at a certain point in my life. When I say struggling, that's an understatement. Uh, but I was blessed in, in that time. Um, there was a woman by the name of Dr. Dolores Seamster. And Dr. Seamster was at one point the director of the reading department all of DISD. And I was teaching if like I had re it was a crazy year. I taught a lot of subjects in my first year it was wild. People were quitting left and right. So I got thrown into teaching reading and writing, which is a star tested subject in fourth grade. And Dr. Seamster was saving grace for me. Um, she would host these these programs for all of the teachers that were in that feeder pattern, there was they called them um, job alikes at the time in the district. But um, what she would do is basically give us basically like trainings once a, uh, once a, well twice to six weeks for the collective, and um, give us these different strategies and these different opportunities to to grow. And I have the data, and I looked at it from the data from 2012 to 2020, I believe is the time frame. And I saw a huge spike in third grade reading scores in that area from the uh, year of 2015 to 2017. And I, my first year teaching was 2014. And I was wondering, you know, like what happened? And it was just in these, this data is strictly to the schools in the super block where she was doing these trainings and it clicked. I said, Dr. Seamster was doing these trainings every year and uh, or every six weeks for us. And I saw that and I said, you know what? They don't do that anymore. Dr. Seamster now is on my board at 4 Oak Cliff. And one of the things that we're working towards now we have the space to do it is to be able to bring teachers in that teach third and fourth grade and have these trainings as a whole as a space for these teachers to come in and be able to have a, a, a space that's outside of the school, which is key, I believe, because a lot of times, you know, the school just makes you feel a certain way. It's a lot in that. But be able to have a space where they can come in and get legitimate training that they can put and apply to their classes immediately so we can start because I saw it in the data and I know that it was beneficial for me. Um, so we'd be able to host those things for the teachers um within the super block and that's just on the elementary school level um we've still kept very close relationships with every school within um the area one of the things that even for our just this week the principal from south oak cliff you no know, he had, uh, you know these students that were not going to be able to graduate they were over age they've already enrolled in our ged program um we host teacher appreciations for the teachers as well within the super block to be able to provide them all of the different you know resources and and just love that they need but that teaching training is one thing that i think is going to be at scale and another thing that we're putting together right now is a um basically basically an education coalition that is going to focus towards a north star goal in our area that we would bring in the executive directors of the schools the the um assistant superintendents that we could get in because it's a lot of different people working on different things but in silos and i don't think there has been a collective effort with one north star goal for everyone to come together um also one last thing to that point we're working with elijah mp's elementary school um they are about to my daughter just came and just waved at but elijah mp's and Bushman Elementary School are about to combine and it'll be one elementary and they're about to get the I, in our area. It'll be the first brand new elementary school built. Um, so we're working with helping get the parole involved with that school. 
um, helping with just the design, a little bit of that school and the leadership at the school so that we can have this state of the art elementary um, to go into the neighborhood as well and support the teachers and students and parents also. Fantastic work. Um, so we have another question here from Gloria. Gloria, I'll give you just a second to unmute if you want to ask, otherwise I can read off the question. So Gloria asked, um, she thanks you for sharing your journey um, and your work. And she says, has gentrification impacted your community and how is your community and organization responding? Yeah, um, not so much in the South Oak Cliff area as currently, or as you know, the North Oak Cliff, Northeast area, um, not yet. But one of the things that we doing because you know development is inevitable you know when there's land um it's, it's just inevitable everything is going south anyway so what we've been able to do here one is to have organizations like lone star justice alliance in our space lone star justice alliance not only does work in criminal justice reform but they also help people to get titles clear and clean um on the streets and they do this service free of charge um, they help individuals to write wills and, and get wills um, as well, which is one of those things when you think about gentrification is, you know, if you don't have ownership of your property, then you're, you're at a loss to the to the beast that, that will be. Um, you know, we've been working with different organizations to learn about particular housing policies um, that can take place for affordable housing. Um, and also tax incentives uh, that our individuals in our neighborhood can receive as we know these things are coming because we are preparing. It hasn't hit us directly yet. Yes, property taxes have increased, um, but with the new deck park coming in that'll be on Marcellus essentially, you know, we know a lot of that is coming our way. Um, so one of the things we're also trying to do is inform people, you know, door knocking, letting people know, asking questions, um, doing some community surveys to figure out the assets of the community that they have. But also the other underlying thing of the community surveys and door knocking is to build power with the people and be able to have, if we need to show up in any space to disrupt something, we'll have the masses with us as well to be able to do so. Um, and that's that's how we've been approaching the organizing space and within gentrification. Wonderful, thank you. Um, unless anybody else has a, a, a last minute question, I think that we'll probably wrap up. Um, and oh, Rachel, the link to the after talk survey, has that been posted yet? There she goes. <laughs> so please um, take a look at the, the chat. I think you'll also get an email if you registered for the event afterwards. Um, and I just want to take a, a moment to really thank you, um, Taylor, for sharing your time with us today. This was such a wonderful way to, to open up Friday and just be inspired and, and um, moved uh, for the rest of the day. So um, please, everyone who's in attendance, take a look at the links. Um, I actually was tooling around on the website recently and it's super easy to volunteer for the different stuff that y'all have going on so I certainly appreciated that so volunteer um, donate if you're able to and um, please you know help us with uh, supporting for and the wonderful work that they're doing so thank you so much no problem thank you all one thing I'd love to leave y'all with and this is for everyone and some physics too by the way is that um, everything is physics, right? If you ever find yourself in a space that you feel that gravity is pulling you down, don't don't fret. That is part of the, the process. Even when you look at a rocket, whenever they, they go and they launch and go out of space, um, there's something that's called escape velocity. And there's a particular time whenever it's gone that the gravitational pull is pulling you down and all these things, always remember that the more that you dig deep into yourself and you find your inner strength that's where your escape velocity lies and you will be able to explode and bust through 
that gravitational pull, which are all the things that are around you, and you'll be able to get to orbit and see everything from a better angle. So I just wanted to share that with y'all. Tap into your escape velocity. Wonderful. I love that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Y'all have a blessed weekend. Thank you. You too. Thank you. All right. All right.